Hello, hello. Come on, right? Yeah. Hello. Good afternoon. <laughs> Welcome to the very last seminar in the Bevan series. My name is Amanda Stanley. I'm the executive director of Compass. And it is my incredible privilege to be here today to introduce Liz Neely. Um, Liz Neely uh, has become the executive director of Story Collider, an organization that is dedicated to producing true personal stories about science. They do live shows, a really terrific podcast, and intensive workshops. Um, has anybody here been to a Story Collider show? Yeah, a few of you? Okay. No judgment. No judgment. If you haven't, go. You should. They are fabulous. And check out the podcast, too. So I've been lucky enough to work with Liz in a variety of ways over the years. Uh, prior to joining Story Collider, Liz worked for Compass for many years, right here at SAFS. And Liz brought so much to her work at Compass. She was a real pioneer in helping Compass bring the science of science communication into our trainings, which really helped us up our game. She really showed us how to leverage social media. Anybody here? Uh, anybody else here join Twitter because of this woman? <laughs> totally. All right. So it, I mean, funny story, it, it took her a couple of years of very gentle nudging. And I finally decided, all right, I'll give it a try for a couple months. I'll experiment. I, you know, fine. I'll, I'll sign up for Twitter. I'll do it. And four years later, I'm still experimenting, and it's awfully fun. <laughs> so but Twitter aside, Liz has for many years, both at Compass and now at Story Collider, been a real key leader in science communication and in helping scientists find their voice. Our organizations cover different parts of this science communication landscape, but what Liz and I share is a passion for helping scientists bring their whole selves to their work. Too many times, scientists feel like they got to check part of their identity at the door in order to do science. And what we have found, both through leadership trainings, from storytelling, is that when we can help scientists bring all that they are to their science, their identities, their cultural heritage, their faith, their hobbies, their uh, role as a community member and a citizen on this planet, when you can tap into all of that and bring your whole self to your work, you are a better scientist, you are a better leader, and you are a better communicator. And what Liz has done at Story Collider is really impressive, and helping scientists sh do that work of integrating their whole selves and share that story with the world. So I'm going to pass things off to Liz. I'm struggling. I lost my voice yesterday morning, which is always an excellent way to start a keynote. So wave at me if you can't hear me, and I'll try and talk louder. Um, let's start by acknowledging how strange a talk like this is. We have made a social bargain, right? I'm promising something to you. Hopefully that I will give you new ideas or help you see old things in a new light. And in return, you're promising me your attention. Now, hopefully, <laughs> we, we all know what attention looks like, right? It's not just what's going on in your head. It's an embodied process. So when people are paying attention, they're leaning forward, they're laughing, they're nodding. One of my favorite papers unfolds another layer of what people are doing when they're paying attention that I was not aware of previously. And that's what we're doing with our eyes. So as a species, we've evolved where visual information was quite important. And so collectively, we tend to keep our eyes wide open during moments of uncertainty or when we're searching for information. And then when that's resolved or that tension is released, we blink. And so what we know is that masterful storytellers, or if you're watching a film, for example, actually induce statistically significant synchronized eye blinking rates <laughs> in audiences, <laughs> which boggles my mind. And this is science, of course, like you can't see it, so don't waste your time staring at the audience, like are they blinking in time? Um, but what's really cool is not just that this is a thing humans do, we act in synchrony like 
you know, this is our particular flocking mechanism. But what we know is that that eye blinking rate is also linked to something really important in the storytelling world. And that's called transportation. So transportation is our jargon term. It comes from the literature. And it is that feeling we all know so well of when you are fully immersed in a story. It's like you're reading a book and you can't hear someone calling your name, or you go to a movie theater and you lose three hours of your life in, in the good way. Um, that's transportation. And that's one of the most interesting and exciting topics when we think about how we use stories for science communication because it is tightly correlated with many of our ultimate goals, like audience engagement and remembering things and being persuaded. And transportation is something I think a lot about as executive director of this organization because I spend my time um, running shows. We hosted 47 last year all over the country. We are, our flagship shows is New York. We're in DC, Boston, LA, St. Louis, Atlanta, as well as Toronto, Vancouver, Wellington, New Zealand, and London. We did 47 of these shows. And what we're asking people to do is to pay money to show up and be entertained. We perform in bars and music halls, things like that. And again, there's that promise. Come to our show, something amazing is going to happen. You're going to laugh, you're going to cry. You're going to see five storytellers take the stage in turn. These are not TED Talks. There's no slides. There's no lectures. They're true, personal stories about science. And every week, we release two of them to our podcast on Friday. You can get it on iTunes or Stitcher, wherever you like your podcast. This is what it looks like. And this is what the opening sounds like. A science story, huh? Did NYU scientists say uh, it felt, felt, felt right? right. But I was so and I just thought, well, I figured it out. It was that golden moment. Because science was on my side. We like that bit. Science was on my side. It's really special if you listen to the podcast with um, earbuds in because the sound mix actually makes those voices sound like they're swirling around your head. And in our business, we call this a vox pop opening. All the voices weaving together, right? And what we really like, and the idea here is that it represents in every way our strong belief that if science and technology is touching everyone's lives, everyone has stories to tell. And they come from all different disciplines, all different career stages, all different kinds of identities of every kind you can imagine. And collectively, science does not only have enough room for all of us, but it absolutely needs representation and inclusion from everyone if it is going to solve the kinds of problems that we face as a society. Now, storytelling is not something that is usually taught as part of science training. <laughs> That's an understatement, right? So we do workshops and trainings as well. And what we find through all of this is that storytelling offers a unique set of sort of contrasts. It's got this duality to it. We think about stories in many ways, one of which is, yes, stories are products. They are things that we send out into the world that play this important persuasive or educational role. But figuring out how we tell them is a process. And stories are meaning-making devices. I'm going to get to this more, but I want to sort of highlight product versus process. It also says a lot that I have read all the papers I can get my hands on. There's more every day. But it only takes us so far to read the scientific literature about how to perform well or how to tell a funny joke, right? So this is that interface between the theory and the practice. And both are richer for the presence of the other. And then finally, what I think really hard about is in these workshops that we teach and in lectures like this, of course I have educational goals in mind. I want you to remember specific things and to have new ideas and understand connections between ideas. But that knowledge is only part of it. What we are also often looking to do is shift attitudes, whether that is towards storytelling as a practice or towards yourself. And perceived self-efficacy is a big goal of ours. So knowledge and attitude. And so Story Collider, I think, is distinguished by its commitment to taking the art and the science of our work equally seriously. And that is a terrifying proposition when you think about what it actually means. This was really hard for me not to think the science comes first, of course, and we use the art to communicate it. That was my own mistake in thinking even when I first joined. It's easy to be put in your place, though. Um, 
when you stand on stage, for example, next to someone, this is my artistic director, Erin Barker. She's the first woman who won the Moth Grand Slam Championship twice. <laughs> you also think you're funny until you stand next to somebody who is professionally funny, and that is a really good lesson in comeuppance. But I, I give myself a little bit of room here because this is not where I intended to be. You know, I started in the best place of the world to start in the ocean. Uh, I'm trained as a marine biologist. This picture is dark because it's, uh, you know, turbid water. Uh, I worked on the evolution of color patterns and visual systems in tropical reef fish in masses. And I was asking questions n about what these fish look like to each other and how they use these color patterns and their behaviors as signaling systems, so communication. And this necessarily meant I had to look at the world through not my own eyes, but fish eyes, and so we would use modeling and math as a way to sort of get at that. Had some of that, I had quite a lot of molecular biology to do. We didn't even have a working phylogeny of these wrasses when I started. And so these are some slides that capture my work um, in early days. And I really loved it. Loved the lab work, loved the field work, hated talking to people. Like, really, really did not want to do public communication in any way. And when I was forced to do it, I came up with the worst elevator pitch I think I've ever heard, and I still cringe to remember it. I would say, what do I do? Oh, I study the synonymous to non-synonymous substitution ratios in the transmembrane regions of rhodopsins in the retinas of wrasses and parrotfish. Like, nailed it, right? Like, I really, that is precisely what I did, and it told you nothing about why it was important, what I was doing, how it worked, right? And we all laugh, like, it's easy to see how ridiculous that is. But at the time, I was trying so hard, right? And like, and I didn't think that people's feelings and their stories mattered because the science was on my side. I learned this the hard way, so when I left grad school, the first project that I really worked on was super cool. We found that we saw high fashion runways featuring coral jewelry. So these were coming down the catwalks in Milan and Paris, and we're like, oh, this is a great opportunity to create a conservation campaign around these deep sea corals that most people don't know exist, much less that coral's an animal, and to connect you know, this luxury item that people wanted so much to the, the animals and the ecosystems that that give us this source. And so being the good fledgling scientist I thought I was and wanted to be, I thought, you know, we need data. This is a fisheries question. What is a sustainable catch rate like? Where do we know these populations are? What's, what's the current status? And through a lot of hard work and collaborations, we got that data. It wasn't the best. You know, there were tons of open questions. But ultimately, we had enough to convince the US and the UK and Germany and a bunch of other countries that we should put forward a proposal at CITES, the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species. Not to ban the trade in these things, but simply to monitor it. How many times have you in this room heard, we can't manage, you know, we can't manage what we can't measure. We wanted to be able to measure it. And the thing was, we had the data and we lost. I had it through in working group. It was great, and it was overturned after the time was up in plenary by secret ballot. And I am not somebody who takes losing very well. I hate losing. <laughs> and I thought, what do we do when we have the data and the data's on our side, but people don't pay attention to it? It's not that we don't need that data. We absolutely do. That is the value that science brings into the world. But we need something else. So we need the data. And I'm excited to see work. This is Malin Pinsky's stuff that I pulled offline. I watched some of the videos from the Bevan series. And it's important now that we're not only looking for physical data about the world and modeling, but also the social science, right? I think you as fisheries, biologists, researchers, policymakers, everyone who has a stake in fisheries are tasked with something unique. It is more than simply describing the world the way it is to us. We are also asking you to be the keepers of memories, to tell us how the world used to be. And then in some very real sense, to give us projections and ideas of what is yet to come, to tell us the story of what is a likely future for us if our behaviors don't change. Is it good or is it bad? And this idea of 
using scenario planning. This is the Radical Ocean Futures project. It's an art science combination. It's pretty cool. You guys should check it out and see what you think of it. Um, it seems outlandish, right? You look at art like this and you're like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's far future thinking, hand wavy stuff. But um, scenario based tabletop planning, I mean, this is how we deal with incredible complexity in all sorts of high risk situations, right? Like military applications or like in Game of Thrones when they need to figure out where to move the pawns. <laughs> And what we know from all the work that has been done about how humans come together and think about futures and try to figure out how to protect ourselves from the bad things and strive for the good things is we know we have cognitive biases. We know that our brains don't work particularly well in some kinds of circumstances. That we think automatically, so fast versus slow thinking, Dan Kahneman's work. We think socially where the reputation or the status of other people gives their words undue weight, right? And we also think, some people say lazily, but I think you know, efficiently. We think using mental models and heuristics that neatly slot new information into our existing models of how the world works. This idea that we need to understand the cognitive biases of the human brain was really appealing to me when I first started thinking about the science of science communication. And what's really cool is you can map these, right? So this is the cognitive bias codex. <laughs> and you can sort of zoom around and think about, it covers four major areas of challenges that we human beings have when we're trying to make sense of information and make decisions. So in the space of too much information, for example, we've got things like, oh, hey, this is a good one. We tend to find stories and patterns when looking at sparse data. Hmm, that's familiar. Um, and worse, when we need to do this under time pressure and we need to act fast, we do things like um, we favor the immediate relatable thing in front of us instead of worrying about what's the biggest threat overall. And then when we think, okay, we gotta deal with a lot of this, we gotta go fast, how do we remember what we've been talking about? We can continue to explore all of these, right? And think about too much information at the same time. Here's the problem. I started digging into all of these. There's more than 200 <laughs> of these cognitive biases. And even this, the most cursory sort of glance through the Wikipedia pages of each of them gives you five to six citations for each. And because it's science, not all of these biases actually hold up and are being actively argued by psychologists who study them. So what do we do? <laughs> I think the answer is we acknowledge that we are human beings with human brains. And yes, these biases hold us back and we need to be aware of them and cautious of them and on guard. But they're a double-edged sword in a way. They are mechanisms that we as a species evolved to help us deal with these very same problems. Can we lean into that? Can we seriously consider using some of these tools instead of fighting against them all the time? And that's what stories represent to me. So my own story, you've heard a little bit of from Amanda, thank you, um, setting us up for this. I worked for Compass for eight years, teaching science communication, how to talk to journalists, haranguing everyone into using Twitter. <laughs> but it was intimidating for me to start, and that's because our space, especially in ocean science communication and fishery science communication, has big personalities. And I was not here um, at I was not at Compass when one of the biggest papers and controversies came out, but oh boy, do I remember Ray Hilborn calling that paper mind-bogglingly stupid in print. And then I knew I was going to have to come here and work with this person. I was intimidated. But the cool thing is, if you don't know this story, you should definitely look it up. We'll share a citation so you've got that history of the field. Ray and Boris Worm ended up on a PBS show debating their perspectives on the future of fisheries, right? This 2048 projection and all of the work that went into the paper that was the meat of the conversation. And they realized they weren't as far apart as it had seemed through the media coverage. And more importantly, they ended up working together to create this paper about rebuilding global fisheries. They co-authored it. It's a big deal when you publish in science and then nature and everyone else on the planet <laughs> covers it. And this makes me think about the ways in which your science, when we tell the story of it, there's many levels. 
And the angle that really got picked up on here is people loved hearing like previous enemies who weren't afraid to like get down and argue with each other now came together to work together. That was a hook. There's other fun stories I was thinking about from my time here. I remember when Daniel Schindler had a cover paper in Nature that I got to work on. I was the media liaison. And uh, not surprisingly, he was out in the field. <laughs> and I had to call a ranger station and ask them if they might send someone to trek over, find Daniel, and ask him if he would please go back to camp and get on the satellite phone because I had 150 journalists who really, really, really wanted to talk to him. <laughs> and so, you know, I think about these stories and what surrounds them and what they mean, and then more importantly, how they connect to the future of fisheries science as a whole. And I was really inspired by Trevor Branch in this. He has a paper about what makes fisheries papers highly cited. And these were a couple of them that I was talking about, and he in fact included a section there on the role of compass and the proportion of the papers that we worked on in fisheries that were highly cited compared to others. And yet, I would like to point out, there is no magic potion. And this is the final sentence of the abstract of that. There's no shortcut to publishing highly cited references, right? They require substantial time, effort, and knowledge. We know that the story of a paper can make it appealing to journalists and can also make a finding really appealing to the public. And this is part of what makes it become memorable or go viral or et cetera. And I think that's partially what scares us. The other thing that I certainly remember very keenly from my own career is that um, initially the word storytelling put my teeth on edge. I'm the oldest of five kids. I wanted to get away from childlike things. And perhaps worse, I remember thinking storytelling is what you do when your data is not particularly strong. It's a little bit of like sleight of hand that you like nudge your audience towards your preferred interpretation. It's a bad thing, I thought. But then I realized not every story has strong characters, and not every story begins with once upon a time. One of my favorite um, fictional authors, Lu Shushen, who just wrote The Three Body Problem recently, has this great quote. He says, the stories of science are far more strange and magnificent than anything we have in literature. Only our stories are locked up in cold equations that most people do not know how to read. Anybody recognize and know how to read this equation? It's from psychology. This is the Rescorla Wagner equation of associative learning. And the beautiful story locked in this particular equation is that learning is what happens when what happens in the world and what you expect to happen prove to be a mismatch, moderated by the salience of that stimulus and the speed of your learning, right? So for example, if I was just going to drop my remote control here and instead of falling to the floor, it just hovered in mid-space you guys would all learn something about me, right? <laughs> and so what this tells me is that if our goal is for people to understand something new about the world, then really what we are thinking about is surprise and salience. We need to tell them something different than what they thought they knew in a way that feels relevant to them. Now, the reason this works this way, and I started digging to understand, like, why do human brains do this, is because in our evolutionary history, you think about this, right? Not only were we threatened by disease and cave bears and things like that, but a major source of mortality for human beings for a long time has been other human beings. And so we urgently need to be able to predict motivations and behaviors, future behaviors of strangers. And so this has left its imprint on us and it got interesting results, right? So in work going back to the 1940s, we know that for neurotypical adults and children, all you need to do is show them pictures of shapes. And then particularly if you start animating those shapes, we almost cannot help but start to weave little stories about like, oh, look at the scared blue dot being menaced <laughs> by the red triangles, right? This used to make me laugh. But I think it is interesting to remember that this is a skill for us. It's not only a shortcoming. And because it is a skill, this connects to this idea that Writing and storytelling is a craft. And I don't know how many of you have had writing training or you read this kind of stuff. There's a plethora of information about how to do it well. And there's all these conventions about story structure that you run into. So let's just take these red triangles and turn them into a different kind. Freitag's pyramid is a classic story shape, right? You begin with exposition, then you've got rising action, a climax of some sort, falling action, and a resolution. 
It's a story. You also see other traditions giving us all sorts of conventions and opportunities for how we might structure information in a way to make it really exciting to listeners so that they keep watching or keep listening. Like the Fichtean curve, right, where you just have crisis after crisis after crisis until falling action and your resolution. Or the hero's journey, right? We all know this one. You're called to adventure, you go out into the world, you travel into the underworld, you've got the ordeals and tests. You go back to the regular world, you return. These patterns are familiar to us. You've probably heard some of them. This is only in the Western tradition, right? When you start to expand this to all the different ways in which people have structured stories over time or have expectation of when information is going to be introduced and when tension is going to be resolved, you could spend a lifetime writing dissertations on effective story structure. What I'm doing right now at Story Collider is trying to distill our methods and what we see working on our stage to the simplest possible form. What we believe is that stories are believable characters experiencing meaningful events, and this is critical, linked by profound causality. Characters experiencing events linked by causality. This is what makes them different from just raw chronology. And it is this causality piece that we know from most of the literature around persuasion and all your science communication goals that we need to be able to understand. This thing happened to this character. They made choices because of it. They took action because of it. These other things happened because of that. And this is the moral of the story. That's where the learning is. That's the takeaway. And what we know is that because of this structure, packaging information this way, as opposed to evidence-based argumentation methods, that stories have all sorts of privileged cognitive sort of results. They're more interesting. People want to listen to them in the first place and they want to keep listening to them. They're more comprehensible, so people understand what is taking place in these formats better and how it relates. And then perhaps, and most excitingly for us, is they are found to be more believable and more persuasive even to resistant and skeptical audiences. These are the reasons I care about story. This was the literature that led me down the path of thinking, I am not a natural born storyteller. I am not a stage performer by training. But there is something here that we need to chase. So let's start with persuasion, because I think that is one of our top science communication goals. I know you've already had several talks in this series, and that on top of your mind in many instances is fisheries policy. And when I think about policymakers and I think about the decisions they face, I feel like we kind of have three categories of choice that we might be talking about. We have action thresholds of determining whether it is time to act or not. We've got fixed options. Do we do A or do we do B? And then we've got new technologies or new plausible futures in which we say, what is possible? We know that your data can show us options here. We also know that science never tells us what to do. Your stories might help you gain entree to have these conversations at critical decision points in the policy process. It's not hand-waving, it's not you know, doing jazz hands to distract people, but rather thinking about what their needs are and contextualizing it to the best of our ability. When I think about fisheries policy and I think about the papers that I helped promote in the past and how these stories fit into it, um, I began with sort of ecosystem uh, service trade-offs and modeling what's happening because it's never simple, right? It's never like, we just want this one fish out of this area. It's, we need all of these different kinds of fish plus recreational value, plus wind power, and everything else. So what we know is that human beings are pretty good at making maximization decisions, right? So if we have a chart with like this thing I really want and this other thing I really, really want, we assume that there's some relationship between the two and that we are innately good at figuring out if that's the relationship between the two, we can figure out where we want to be on this curve. In the real world, those curves start to get weirder looking, and so we need science to help us figure out what is the relationship between these, right? Sometimes you get slightly counterintuitive answers, but then what happens when you push it into many, many dimensions, the things that we cannot show you in a slide? This is the messy, political, difficult, social conversation we have. Not only what does the data say, but also what are our values? 
What are our preferences? And how do we collectively negotiate among those? I'm an author on a paper that took a stab at giving us a decision-making tool, or at least like a guide, to help us look at these kinds of questions. The Ocean Health Index was by Ben Halpern et al. in 2012. I know there's all sorts of kinds of shortcomings to something like this, but I also remember how keenly I felt the challenge of being pressured by media people and the like comms people and the press officer teams, like, what's the story? What's the story of this paper? What's the story of the child who won't eat because of whatever, you know? And I push back against it because that felt so wrong to me and so hard. And what we're doing so many times in science is many levels deeper than what a single individual can experience or what sounds nice in a sound bite. And I got frustrated, and this was part of the reason why I thought, oh, stories. But then I remembered, and I've come to learn, stories and narrative are not only these emotional, character-driven things. Remember I talked to you about causality, those causal linkages? There's also structural stuff that happens. And work from Ann Hillier and Ryan Kelly and Terry Klinger here too also has started taking stabs at, even within the technical literature, what are the ways in which these narrative devices we have can help us understand how to get ideas across. And it, this is not about emotion or evocative sensory scenes. But we're finding, they found here that even that when you control for as much as you possibly can, what we see is a strong correlation between narrative styles and journal impact factors and between citation rates and journal impact factors. But I think there is something here, and this is science. I want us to dig in more. How can we use communication science to make sure that in a noisy, crowded, complicated, confusing, difficult world that our messages get so let's think about this a little bit more. I told you transportation is something that's on the top of my mind. What we know is when someone is being transported, that different kinds of people are more or less likely to be transported. Some of us have a high need for cognition. Some of us have a high need for affect. Affect is more like emotion rather than thinking. It varies over time and also by the topic and how much previous knowledge you have. But it doesn't matter. We all do this at some point. And when we do, we know that there's a few things going on, two major ones. One is intense processing, and the other is uncritical processing. So intense processing is independent of the valence of that affect. It doesn't matter like happy, sad, whatever. It's the difference between saying like, oh, that was a sad story versus inadvertently like ugly crying and hiccuping while you're trying to recover, right? That's intensive processing. And then uncritical processing is not, it is not turning off your logical mind. It is reducing the amount of counter-arguing that someone has within the story world itself so that they find the dialogue plausible or the cause and, re and effect reactions to be a good mechanism, a sort of like it explains what happened satisfactorily. One of my favorite things I've read recently suggested that stories are cognitive representations of externally repeatable mechanisms, and that's why they work. Cognitive representations of repeatable mechanisms. They are models that we build and break about the world around us. And so if you are a person like me, and you don't have the stage training or the innate orientation towards this kind of performance, and you want to know how to tell a good story, how to tell a story that transports, we can dig into what creates intense and uncritical processing. And these are called narrativity factors. I am not going to go through these one by one, surprisingly. Because the point is, we could go all the way through, and yet it's not going to help you perform better on our stage. Because this is science. These are hypotheses about what we see, and it's not all figured out yet. And even if it were, if you read every citation here and you knew everything, again, that theory and practice divide is tricky. But I was challenged on this because I had a collaboration last semester with engineers at Boise State University. And not surprisingly, being engineers, they needed a rubric to explain the difference between a good story and a bad story and to really break it down. So I built out a single point rubric, right? So in the middle is the narrative dimension. This is all based on the literature I've read. And then for each story, we could talk about what needed improvement and then what was excellent. And I tried to go through and think about and talk to them in ways that made sense about what means like that your characterization in the story is really powerful versus when it's weak. 
And so we can talk about how singular stories and specificity in our concrete details in the events and non-trivial events make for stronger stories. We can talk about how characters who do something and interact with other characters in a story make it more engaging and appealing than stories in which that doesn't happen. And so we can go on and on. But I know my science, and I know that reading you this table is not anywhere nearly as interesting as showing you the pictures and the faces of the people who told their story on our stage. So in December, we performed a sold-out show at Boise State. This is Arvin. He told a story about being a welder and what happens when a chronic lung disease interrupts your career. And for more than 30 years, you've been a blue-collar guy who knows how metal behaves with your hands. And then that's stripping, that's stripped away from you. In fact, that the chronic lung disease he got was a result of breathing the aerosolized metal that he knew so well. His story tells how he found his way out of depression and out of his, his health struggles into engineering, where now he's starting to understand intellectually what those metals are doing in a way he understood with his hands and his muscles and his back before. He talks about how engineering helped him weld his past to his future. We have Kylie Lay talking about chronic disease issues that she struggled with. We have Eric Jankowski telling a story about when he was a teenager at camp and he engaged in all these like warfare that was happening with the camp counselors and he inadvertently realized he'd bullied another kid. And then he did an interesting about face about now as a faculty member, as an engineer, he's thinking about when do we speak up when we see bullying happening? And when are we just inadvertently going along and making things worse? I had a, Simon, a student named Simon who talked about cycling. And his story was about thermodynamics and dynamic equilibrium. It was also about body issues and about eating disorders <laughs> as he got skinnier and skinnier to ride that bike and how climbing helped him find his way. And we closed with Steve, who was a veteran and opened his story with flashbacks from his time in combat and PTSD and the way that engineering helped him not only put his life back together and figure out how to fix things that had been shattered, but it saved his life. This is what stories can do. Also, I don't know about you, but my expectations of how emotionally vulnerable I expected engineers to be with me <laughs> were not all that high. There's something profound about all of this. And I think it's, um, it's not just about feelings either. So like, let's switch gears and talk about memory. If we want people to understand and remember facts, I have a new collaboration. Um, I have an appointment at Yale uh, in the School of Medicine with the National Neuroscience Curriculum Initiative. And our goal is to take neuroscience concepts, integrate them into every aspect of training, and so that psychiatrists think about neuroscience and incorporate it into their practice in the future. So we're talking about medical residents who are already highly motivated and are there specifically for educational purposes. It's really interesting to ask, how much are they remembering of what they are being taught and what they are expected to know? All of you who are students or faculty members in this room know this is a question on the back of all of our minds. We take surveys so that we can collect data and ask questions that the leaders in the field expect these residents to know about what are NDMA receptors. 73% just say no idea. We ask questions about what is TDCS and how is that thought to work? 84% have no idea. We ask what is a dread? And 91% they say they have no idea. And of the 9% who answer, some of them give saucy answers like the feeling I got reading the survey about how little neuroscience knowledge <laughs> I, I have. And so in this field, the tradition has been that global, world-class experts come in, give 90-minute lectures, it's called Grand Rounds, and this is how you are expected to learn like cutting-edge neuroscience in the field. And what we think we can do is improve on that. That we can use principles from adult learning and all of this like attentional stuff and using the structures of storytelling. And our mental model is this. If you give someone a perfectly formed single bite of dessert, they will love it, they will remember it, they will want more. If you force feed them 10 pounds of chocolate, they will vomit and never want to look at dessert again, right? <laughs> so we're trying to think about the ways in which we can lean into the beauty and enthusiasm and joy that experts have in their fields 
and to share that with those they're trying to train rather than force feeding them 10 pounds of chocolate. There's a really cool study that looks at this um, question about creativity in knowledge and in this space in neuroscience. So you ask 325 or so people to draw a neuron different career stages. And you see this incredible sort of stratification. Up top, those are undergraduates. They recapitulate what you would see in a textbook, which is like, okay, good, they're actually learning what they're supposed to be learning, right? But they're all the same. And it's also a drawing that could have been done about 100 years ago. The second layer, these are postdocs and senior graduate students. They're starting to draw representations of what they see under a microscope. So their concept of a neuron is more like, what do they see, what do they interact with? And then down here on the bottom, the drawings that you might call less good <laughs> are all the PIs and the senior researchers. And what they are doing is not just scribbling because they're in a rush and don't want to do this, but they are giving you a creative representation of what they think neurons do. There's a creative process here where they are drawing a hypothesis of what a neuron is and what it does. And I think all of us know what it is like when you are talking to a colleague, you're talking to a scientist, and you tap into that thread, that magnificent obsession, and they just light up, right? That joy <laughs> is a really profound, sort of singular human emotion. This movie, Inside Out, is not a bad representation of major emotional categories in human beings. And we can use them. We can think about this. And we can think about it in a very pragmatic way. Because we know, for example, that when the question is, how do we make stories go viral? That part of the answer to that is things like joy, <laughs> awe, emotion, surprise, anger. And we have scientists, we have researchers who are experimenting and looking at this question of, what is the role of emotion in helping people to process and to think? It doesn't make us dumb. It plays a role. Like, so this work by Robin Navi and Melanie Green inspires me. It's not the prettiest model for you. I didn't sex it up. But basically what they're saying is people seek out. They have an, a desire for a shifting emotional state. And what happens is if you have that in your story, if you have people going through those highs and lows with your main characters, something really cool is going on. What we see is greater information seeking. We see repeated viewing, social sharing, so people go back to stories, they read them again, they talk to their friends about it, and that, friends, that is the kind of stuff that actually makes people change their beliefs and attitudes and behaviors, and not just their own, but the people around them. I want us to get more sophisticated in thinking about how information flows through networks and what the role of emotion is. We like to borrow from Kurt Vonnegut. He had a rejected master's thesis from the 1950s where he imagined what these emotional shapes of stories look like, right? Up at the top is great good fortune, health, wealth, well-being, everything you've ever dreamed of. Down at the bottom is the inverse of that, sorrow. Reviewer number two, you know, whatever. <laughs> and he hypothesized that as you move through time, a story has to go up and down, that the characters experience emotional shifts, highs and lows, or else it's boring, right? Because if my story is, I'm awesome, I've always been awesome, I never struggled, this thing happened, and I dealt with it in a really awesome way, what's the point, right? And the cool thing is that these um, sort of precepts from great masters of art forms bear, are borne out by you know, cutting edge science. So if we take 40,000 works of fiction in the English language and chunk it through you know, big computing, looking for semantic analysis of texts, what we see is that six major story shapes fall out. And these are familiar to us. There's, you know, you start low, you end high, rags to riches, yay. Or the inverse of that is a tragedy. You can start adding inflection points, right? So we've got woman in a hole, I'm going along, doing my thing, I stumble and fall, and then because of my gumption and teamwork and all the rest of it, I, I improve. Um, or maybe like an Icarus curve. We love poetic justice, and so stories of greed or a lack of humility, like we really like that. And then you can continue adding in additional shapes as you see fit. If you like this stuff, it's really fun to think about and to play with. If you don't like this stuff, like I didn't like this stuff early in my career, the good news is that if you walk away from this lecture, remember nothing else, 80% of what you need to know about stories and story structures is simply this. 
they have a beginning, a middle, and an end, and in the middle, something changes. That can be the world around you. It could be you yourself, and it doesn't matter how abstract or esoteric or difficult or complex your science is. With some careful thinking, with applying basic rules of storytelling, you can tell a story about anything. And if you don't believe me, I would say if you had told me five years ago that one of the biggest Broadway hits ever would be about the establishment of national banking policy, <laughs> right? none of us would believe that. But it matters, and it matters in so many different ways, this musical, right? It helps people understand history. It also had this really important component about representation and identity, belonging. So that's going to be my final section. We think about identity, what it means to be a scientist. There are classic experiments. Everybody's seen these at some point, right? The Fermilab stuff. You take 2,000 seventh graders, ask them to draw a scientist, and what you get almost without fail, sorry guys, old white men in lab coats, bald glasses, doing dangerous stuff, <laughs> right? So, and one of them that I didn't grab, they actually had a little word bubble that said, wah ha ha, and now I take over the world. <laughs> Now, in this intervention, all they did was take those kids to Fermilab, sit them down in different small groups with the actual engineers and physicists who work there, and what do you know, at the end of it, and these are paired for the same child, they start drawing a representation of the people who actually do science. People of color, women, you know, the whole gamut. And they write cute little things like, I didn't know you could be a scientist and play ping pong too. You know? <laughs> this is great. But it's not just kids that have these ideas about who gets to be a scientist and what a scientist looks like and what they do. One of my proudest moments at Story Collider so far is that our episodes have been used in studies. So this is um, at a community college with many of the students coming from underrepresented minority households, most of them taking science for the first time and being the first member of their family to go to college. They were assigned, in addition to their regular curricula, Story Collider episodes paired with some of the content of the course. This is a human biology course. And what we found is that the stereotypical descriptions of scientists, using words like, like you know, lone geniuses and arrogant and that kind of stuff, um, dropped pre and post exposure and stayed stable for six months afterwards. We also saw that the ways they described scientists expanded and diversified in lots of different ways. What we saw was interesting. For those who changed the language that they were using about scientists, they got better grades in the course. And perhaps most importantly of all, those same students who changed the way they talked about scientists reported feeling more of a sense that there might be a future in this for them, that this was something they belonged to and could potentially own themselves. When I think about what this means um, for those of us who are teaching, and those of us who are students, I'm going to blitz through this because I know we don't have a lot of time, is there's this whole concept of self-authorship in higher education. Self-authorship is the difference between, for example, on the cognitive scale, thinking that knowledge is certain and answers come from authority. That's sort of an externalized view of knowledge. And then by awareness of multiple uncertainties and view perspectives, starting to understand that knowledge is contextual and that answers come from evaluating and interpreting evidence. Right? There's two more, pers two more dimensions of this, interpersonal and intrapersonal, where again we're going from um, having our whole identity determined by our popularity and our relationships with others, requiring other people's approval, to understanding that we are inter interdependent with diverse other people and we negotiate to meet mutual needs to holding unexamined values and being unaware of our social identity to understand that our values can be distinct from other people's perceptions. Listening to stories helps people make these difficult transitions between imagining the world as simple and black and white where experts know the answers and give them to us to being able to more fully function as humans, as citizens, as decision makers. And it's not just telling these stories, but listening to them too that underpins this growth. So yes, I know. I mean, I started this with that cognitive bias codex. I know stories can be misused. But that's because they are a tool. 
And any tool can be used to, you know, build houses just as well as it can be used to break kneecaps. <laughs> we need to think about stories and how they can be applied in an ethical way. And an easy starting point is that our fields, our disciplines, have embedded in them oral histories. Like, who did what when? What's the story behind the manuscript? What's everything that's not getting published? I recently launched a new series at PLOS Biology that we edited and commissioned six pieces about conservation stories from the front lines, in which well-established, credentialed scientists are talking about highly cited results, big papers they had, important insights and breakthroughs, and telling the stories behind the stories. These were peer reviewed, and people get really excited to be able to feel like they've got access to that knowledge. It is a richer understanding of science, and I think we are all better for it. So I will close out by talking about when we ask, why do we tell stories? It is not, it is not to sort of stealth educate people and sneak the broccoli of knowledge into the, like the chocolate of entertainment. That's gross, right? <laughs> we tell stories, human beings as a species tell stories because it is important for us to give voice to experience. This ties into our mental health needs, this self-authorship idea. We tell and listen to stories to bear witness to suffering because we all know in this room there are all sorts of problems that our best available science cannot solve. There are illnesses we cannot fix. There are problems that are going to get worse. In the medical literature, we see, though, that for some pain patients where no drug touches their suffering, on the days that they go to group, on the days that they get to tell their story and they feel heard, they feel less pain. We also know from work on sort of democracy and procedural fairness that when people feel respected and they feel heard, that they are more likely to go along with policy decisions that are not their preference as long as they feel legitimately a part of that process. We tell stories to construct identity, to figure out who we are, to police our professional boundaries, and also to find value and confidence in who we are as individuals as well as a group. And we tell stories to galvanize action. I know it can be overwhelming in an era of social media and Twitter and everything else, right? It's hard right now. It's noisy. We feel subject to the tyranny of the like. <laughs> and I often admit I feel nervous too when we know that there are snowball effects and people like stuff, not only because they like it, but because other people who they admire liked it and there's bandwagon effects and there's computer algorithms and it gets confusing. But I end up looking at this slide and coming back to where I started, which is with fish, <laughs> with animals in the natural world. And I realize this looks like a flock of birds or a school of fish. And nobody ever asks why fish school or birds flock and if they are stupid because they do so. Instead, we might look at these behaviors, marvel at a murmuration moving across an evening sky or gasp into our regulator underwater as silver waterfalls happen. If we are mathematically inclined or intellectually curious, we can ask about the mechanisms by which our nearest neighbor interactions create this sweeping through the sky. How does the flock do this? I posit to you today that stories are how people fly in flocks. I hope we can enjoy them. I hope we can study them. I hope we can all be better for appreciating this component of our psychology and our history. And I hope that you all understand that more than anything else, you have amazing stories. I hope you tell them. I hope you tell them well. Thank you.
Oh boy, that is such a big question. <laughs> As the students from the undergrad class will tell you, I've been on a roll today, so I'm trying not to answer in 20 minutes or another presentation. So when it comes to the science of science communication on politicized and hot button issues, one of the most important things we need to understand is we are not, we are often, almost always, not arguing about facts. That people understand the arguments, they remember it, they can recap it about what is happening with climate change, what's, at, what's the root cause. The problem is that these issues have been entwined with issues of identity. Which political party you belong to is signified by how you talk about some of these politicized issues. And so the problem is, in those situations, not only is it, okay, so the, the science deficit model is this idea um, that as scientists we like to think like, oh, people are empty vessels, and if only we give them enough data, if, if they knew what we know, we would all hold hands and happily skip down the path together, right? That's not true. It's never true even in the best of circumstances. It is especially not true when identity is involved. And so what we know is that continuing to throw data at people and charts and graphs and to break down their arguments and to embarrass them, all that does is entrench them in their worldview even further. And so what we need to do, if we want to actually connect and communicate, is figure out ways in which we can validate people's identities and their values first and then talk to them about what it is. I think the real problem is what we're asking is for them to change their lives, right? We're, we're asking people to make sacrifices or to change what's comfortable and familiar. And so the people who I think are doing it really well, I mean, the obvious example is Dr. Catherine Hayhoe. She's an, a Christian, an evangelical Christian, who talks about stewardship of the earth, and I think that's a great way to do it. There's old tape of Richard Alley talking about uh, glaciers and like he's a dad, he goes to soccer practice. I think we have to understand the hard truth of some of this messaging stuff is that human beings, when they assess strangers, we make all sorts of assumptions about their worldview and who they are based on tiny bits of information. What are you wearing? Do you look like a hippie? You know, I, one time I was uh, at a, a wedding party, I ordered my dinner, and the guy next to me was like, I had you pegged as a vegetarian the second you walked in here. And then he wanted to talk about climate change because he knew I was a vegetarian, which is like, right? We are not always the best messengers for every community. And so what we have to do is figure out who are the champions, who are the influential people, what do they need? And also, how do our, as, as experts, how do our mental models of how all these factors relate match or mismatch the mental models of the populations we're trying to speak to? So I think we need the natural scientists, we need the physical scientists, we need the artists all working together on this topic. I don't want to speak for people because I think it's, it's dangerous, but um, shame and vulnerability and the fear of their judgment of their colleagues. So many times what we see is that people break down and when they have, when they're ready to like finally tell us what they're feeling and thinking, half the people in the room are crying along with them and saying, I have felt exactly that same thing. I've struggled with depression too, or like all of these things. And yet, so many of us feel like we're the only ones. And I think especially in science, the problem is we have a, all these assumptions that we are making that are actually empirical questions of like, can't show my humanity because that'll reduce my credibility. Like, actually, what's the mechanism there and do you have any data, <laughs> right? And so there are people working on this now about who is trustworthy, um, what it means to be an advocate, are you allowed to advocate for something, does that reduce your credibility, the personal, the emotional, et cetera. I think so that's a big part of the answer is the fear of getting up and embarrassing yourself and damaging your career or worse, damaging the science communication space for the issues you care about. Other than that, it's just legitimately hard to do. It's weird to stand up on stage and talk about like a breakup or um, a disappointment or a time where you failed or where someone's failed you. We d are not trained to do that. <laughs> Um, but I think that's what I get most excited about is everybody does it naturally 
And so if we can just legitimize this as an enterprise, protect people from going too far and, and divulging things they don't want to share or maybe not being self-aware of realizing how the audience is responding to a story, um, that's where I think the real work can be done. Yeah, how do I resolve that? So I think the magical thing about what is available to all of us in storytelling is we all sit in these interconnected, diverse networks. We talk to the people who are like the parents of our kids on the soccer field, or like, you know, my dad is a conservative Republican, retired Air Force prosecutor. Like you can imagine his, his values and his worldview and his friends, <laughs> right? And so, but they all know me and they love me and they trust me. And so I may not be able to, you know, at scale, get my story across to those kinds of people, but I certainly can locally. And I've been wondering lately, we talk about this think globally, act locally, not just in the climate change space, but in the communication spaces as well. When you read the literature about how information flows through networks, of course there are media effects. There's all this agenda setting theory, the influence of gatekeepers, how much we trust, like these familiar faces talking on TV. The harder research to do, the stuff I'm most excited about, is how all of that is mediated by word of mouth and interaction with trusted sources who are close to us. So this is where I get excited, and it's where I challenge. For social media, for me, it's not about the numbers, right? Our goals are not simply like getting 8 million people to read a thing, but rather to think about are there influential people in other networks who we can share these ideas with and that they can interpret them and then share them in their own way. So that's really what I see it coming down to, is not, of course we still need big media campaigns, of course film and documentary and you know all this stuff matters. And I also think, yes, we've got these hardened silos and bubbles, but they're not perfect and they're not impermeable. So maybe somebody feels really strongly one way about like climate change, but they care about butterflies and they don't think the two connect and they listen to, they hear a story about butterflies and resilience to you know, ecosystem disruption and that's the way in for them. I think it can be done. We just have to change our concept of scale. I hope so, because that slide I listed of all the things that stories help us do, including bear witnessing to suffering, it's not just about science communication. It's about mentorship. How do we build institutions that actually support the people who are part of them rather than hurting them? How do we relate to each other and reduce conflict because we understand maybe a little bit more of the motivation or rationalization? And I do think, I, I think and hope it will be better I'm not asking, I am not asking, I want to say this really clearly. I don't want all of you on my stage. I mean, I would love that. But like, that's not the end goal here, right? Having a sensitivity and an appreciation of stories is going to help you in many different ways. Some of my colleagues at Yale, for example, after we've gone through this whole process, they've revised the way they've written grants and they credit new money, research coming in, because they're telling a story better because they're making the persuasive case for why this is exciting research. So I see there being lots of endpoints, whether that is about doing better teamwork, looking to team science and thinking about interdisciplinary collaboration, whether it's better mentorship and inclusion in our professions, whether it's better grant writing and fundraising, whether it's better public communication. This skill of storytelling and understanding narrative as a tool cross, cuts across all of those things. And I think it makes our science better too. Because in, in order, like, 
I read these papers in such a different way when I'm making slides and when I'm thinking about how I'm going to tell other people about what I have seen. It's a beautiful thing, you guys. Truth and beauty together. <laughs> Yeah. Thank you so much for Thank you. Oh, and the end of the Bevan. Yeah, thanks so much. I want to also say a big thank you to Julia Perry for organizing the Bevan Charity. Awesome. That was really cool. Thank you. Yeah, you can tell how much I love.